Hello, 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 and welcome back, family, to my channel. My name is Huddy, and tonight we're talking New York by night. As always, this video is not scripted, and these opinions are mine and mine alone. Just a quick disclaimer before we start, some of you may know that I am a community ambassador for World of Darkness, and so any teasers you might see for upcoming episodes of New York by Night were likely made by me, meaning I did have early access to the episodes, but I recorded my thoughts or at the very least wrote down some bullet points before moving on to the next episode. Now with that out of the way, let's talk about Season 1, Episode 4, Like a Graveyard, shall we? Once again, we're treated with an amazing opening from Jason Carl, comparing kindred society to the tears on a cake, with our coterie on the bottom with all of the other young, numerous fledglings, those seated above them looking down on them, much more removed from the reality of a night city. The top layer, though, is so small that those in the middle tier may think they are, in fact, on top. Six nights have passed since the Coterie ran into Annabelle the Bruja from LA as she made her way through the Bronx, and in that time we learn what each of the Coterie had been up to. Ray, we learn, has done his utmost to keep his distance from Fuego, likely due to her influence in him taking the life of a mortal. So instead, Ray has spent some time with Drexler, using his corporate know-how to strike up a money laundering deal with the taxicab business owner, in order to inject some funds into this newly formed Coterie. Ray gets to launder money through Drexler's business, and Drexler no longer has to deal with Richter, with Ray ensuring him that all pay payments of rent for both of them will be done by Ray. After spending some time with Drexler, Ray also learns that he is a caitiff. Caitiff, also known as the clanless, are vampires that do not officially belong to any clan. They have no inherent clan weakness or markings and no inherent discipline. Historically, caitiffs suffer a social stigma from not being a part of an accepted clan, and as a result, more established kindred feel free to snub or belittle them free freely. Fuego goes to check in on her family, specifically her mother, Carol Walker. We learn about Fuego's mom, that she keeps a house full of love, family, and a little bit of chaos. Carol also doesn't like it when Fuego texts her, as she doesn't like technology. And the internet is something that happens to other people. Carol acts like a loving mom, praising Fuego for looking so good, and chastising her for never making it to Sunday brunch in equal measure. We also learn that Carol is the one who gave Fuego her gun, a 22, when she turned 18, and Fuego still has it to this day. Fuego also goes to check in on the Bronx Borough Council, where she used to work, and they are less than gracious compared to her mother in regards to her absence. They also ask her about pics of her at the cage that apparently her ex, Mateo, had taken and shared with everyone in the council. They tell Fuego about the Crescent, which she knows about already, and they complain about the developer's marketing strategy, calling it the new Sobro, or South Bronx. Fuego offers to look into it, and the council are appreciative, warning Fuego that nothing about the Crescent seems to be on the up and up. We also learn that Fuego still has the blood bag from Drexler's in her purse from like two weeks ago, back in episode one. Now, I understand. I am the worst when it comes to cleaning out my closet and my bags. My house is always clean, but I'm basically Monica from Friends. No, you weren't supposed to see this! I'm married Fred Sanford! But Fuego, girl, dump that blood bag like Mateo. You'll be better for it. Seraph, we learn, has been bouncing around nightly from location to location, which is no surprise considering the bane of the Ravnos clan. Ravnos risk burning and scorching from within and suffer aggravated damage if they slumber in the same place more than once in seven nights, with each location needing to be at least a mile apart from the last. This is because the sun's fire that incinerated their founder during the Week of Nightmares rages on through their vitae, dooming every member of the clan. If you want to learn more about Ravnos, I have a video about them right here. We also learn that after encouragement by Isaac and meeting Annabelle, Seraph is finally ready to learn more about what this whole unlife thing means, so she decides to call her sire, who we learn is named Argus. Now, I did have a note written down back in episode two about Seraph calling her beast Argus, but because the beast could be lots of people, I decided not to bring it up, but now we have confirmation. We also have confirmation that Seraph is not her real name, which seemed pretty obvious, but instead Argus calls her Theodora. Argus agrees to help her and asks her about her latest art piece, which Seraph calls angry and raw, and informs Argus they will see it if they look in the right places. Argus tells Seraph that they will leave them a dead drop somewhere soon, and informs her that her mother misses her, but more about that later. We also learn that Seraph is, in her own words, helping Isaac gussy up his haven, as well as painting a mural in her room. The mural is black on one side and white on the other. The white side is painted with feathers and two A's, one for Argus and one for Seraph's mother, Alicia. On the black side is painted the initials of her coterie mates, as well as a strange symbol reminiscent of sun rays, or maybe spokes of a wheel, split down the middle. The symbol is one that Seraph thinks about often, but seems to be unaware is the symbol of Clan Ravnos. 
Isaac seems to enjoy Seraph's company and contributions to his haven, and based on, not her mural, rather her habits of moving from place to place and creating illusions, is able to correctly determine that she is of the Ravnos clan. Michael informs Isaac that he got a new car for him, specifically a minivan, in order to accommodate his coterie. We also learn that Isaac had sent Michael to check up on two people, Sarah and Marcus, likely Isaac's touchstones, and they are safe and not behaving out of the ordinary, wherever and whoever they are. Isaac, like Ray, also goes and visits Drexler to return the briefcase he had taken nearly two weeks ago after copying all of the old tech, of course. Isaac asks Drexler what Shreknet is, and Drexler gives the same explanation as Annabelle, that it was the vampire internet, but it doesn't exist anymore due to mortal hacking by the Second Inquisition. Drexler made a deal with the Putinesca to get these pieces of the Shreknet code, in the hopes of handing it off to Nosferatu for a significant profit. But something went wrong. Drexler doesn't go into detail, but ultimately he didn't come up with the money to pay off the Putinesca or Richter, so that's why the Coterie ran into them when they met Drexler that night. Isaac tells Drexler that his coterie is in charge of Port Morris now, and if the Hikata bother him again, to come to them. Drexler offhandedly asks if he has to tell the coterie if he sells off the Shreknet code, even if it's not to Anarchs. Isaac smartly tells him that since Ray is his financial advisor, it would be wise to keep at least Ray in the loop of every time money exchanges hands, no matter whose hands it is. When the Coterie gather at Isaac's Haven after their week of activity, Isaac kicks off the meeting by informing them that he has held back some of his kindred knowledge, because he was unsure if they were going to, in fact, become a Coterie or not, and that he's not accustomed to tipping his hand unless necessary. But he promises to be more forthcoming with knowledge in the future to the best of his abilities. Isaac divulges what he learned about Shreknet, as well as naming each of the clans his coterie belonged to based on his observations, and they all seem very impressed. Isaac also mentions that Ray seems to be the odd man out in his clan, and Ray divulges that he was attacked in an alley and woke up like this, without any mentor, and that he has learned the ropes, so to speak, on his own. The Coterie then start discussing the factions, the hardline rules of the Camarilla, the death cult that is the Sabbat, and the chuckle fuckery of the Anarchs. Again, one of these really great quote-unquote sit-down scenes where they discuss lore, what's going on in their city, and how it affects each other. Some of my favorite moments in the By Night series are these moments. Angela interrupts with a report and Ray immediately gets up and offers her a seat. Angela doesn't seem to be prepared to sit down with them, but Ray also doesn't seem to be ready to sit back down until she does. Isaac asks her to sit and she reluctantly does. And this prompts Seraph to ask Angela if she's not used to sitting on the first floor despite living there, and Isaac responds that they haven't spent much time here yet. Angela's report is about the monster scene in the neighborhood, and although she doesn't have a description, she's heard it's very strong and very fast, and suggests it could be a lupine, aka a werewolf, and very reminiscent of Annabelle in LA by Night Season 1, the Coterie minus Isaac all seem very amazed that werewolves exist. Angela also mentions that she was given this suggestion by Valklop, who we learn is the name of Isaac's sire. In terms of finding it, Angela is at a loss, and suggests that based on its lack of flight pattern, and since its victims are half-eaten, they might want to use someone as bait, to which Seraph immediately volunteers as a true vampire daredevil. Instead of possibly sacrificing Seraph to a werewolf, Wolf, Fuego suggests that since they are de facto landlords of Port Morris, reporting directly to Richter, that they could offer to cover other kindred's rent in the area in exchange for the boon of looking for this monster. Man, every episode, Fuego shows us more and more how blue her blood really is. Angela thinks that this is a very good idea and that she and Michael could take a census of the neighborhood, but she confesses to not always be able to tell who is kindred and who is not, to which Isaac reminds her that if she concentrates hard enough, she can, in fact, do that, likely referring to the fact that ghouls gained the first dot in their Domitor's highest rate rated discipline, along with a single level one power possessed by the vampire. In this case, I'm guessing Angela has sensed the beast, which allows the vampire, or in this case, the ghoul, to sense the beast present in mortals, vampires, and other supernaturals, gaining a sense of their nature, hunger, and hostility. Apparently, the Coterie did not know Michael and Angela were ghouls, which I'm guessing Isaac never said it outright, rather just to the storyteller, and this revelation enrages Seraph. Angela claims to be happy in her new life with Isaac, but it means very little to Seraph, who knows firsthand that ghouls have a hard time saying no to their masters, because we learn that her mother is a ghoul, likely to her sire, Argus. Man, I want the story of Seraph's embrace like yesterday. Bring out the family photos. I want the whole story. 
While explaining to the Coterie what ghouls are, as far as her experience and understanding goes, Angela makes a comparison to Thinbloods, claiming they are more similar to them than they are full-blooded kindred. The conversation turns to a discussion of other clans and their affinities for certain disciplines, as well as Ray asking what a caitiff is, since Ray learned that Drexler is one. And if you want a more in-depth video about Thinbloods and caitiff, you can watch that here. Through all of this, Isaac really makes good on his promise to be more open and forthcoming about his knowledge about kindred, and Alex and Jason and work as an amazing team to parse out the lore in easy-to-digest pieces. Before the Coterie leave in Isaac's new minivan, we also learn that Fuego and Ray did not clean up the body that they left behind in that alley, and thus an increased police and media presence are in the neighborhood. Fuego and Ray confess that this is their fault, but no one seems to be mad at them, merely suggesting to be neater with their feeding next time. Passing by various late-night businesses like a 24-hour laundry, the Coterie is out monster hunting. Isaac and Fuego discuss how much they miss coffee, Seraph admits to stalking food trucks to watch people eat, and Ray offhandedly mentions that he keeps a bottle of whiskey in his penthouse that he knows he'll never open. At the mention of a penthouse, Fuego, of course, asks why they aren't there right now living it up. Ray claims he can't go back to it, to Manhattan, and promises to one day share the story with the Coterie. I can't wait. When they pass by the coffee shop, Angela points out the reporter who is sniffing around Sean's murder at the hands of Fuego and Ray. Isaac tells Angela to learn more about him if he sticks around, but suggests they all just leave him be and not draw more attention to the situation. As Michael drives, Isaac and Ray use Eyes of the Beast to see better into the darker areas of the neighborhood and by the bridges on the outskirts of their territory. Seraph and Fuego seem eager to commiserate with the locals rather than just do surveillance, and both of them get hungrier as they activate the blush of life. Isaac and Ray acquiesce, and all of them approach some men gathered around a metal drum with a blazing fire inside. As Seraph and Fuego take point and make their way towards the humans, they both need to check for frenzy, specifically Hochrek, the red fear, the danger of fire. Thankfully, they both pass with flying colors and are able to hold back their beasts for now. One of the men, named Mert, recognizes Fuego as Carol Walker's kid, and she gives him 20 bucks not to tell her mom, which was just so great. They ask him about the monster, and Mert claims to have seen it chasing someone, calling it sort of human-looking with monster makeup, torn clothes, and long fingernails. The Coterie head back to the car, and as they continue driving, Michael slams the brakes and Angela jumps out of the car as they see the creature before them. We learn that it was once a vampire, but is now a mindless monster, something known as a white. A white is a vampire whose humanity has fallen to the rating of zero, completely consumed by their beast. All human personality is gone, replaced by a primal cunning and aggression. They are, for all intents and purposes, the persona of the beast, now and forevermore. Besides Final Death, if there is a game over for a character in Vampire the Masquerade, this is it. Angela fires immediately, but it doesn't even register that it's been hit. Isaac attempts to compel the white, but Seraph uses chemistry to create a small fire on the shoulder of the monster, and the white goes absolutely berserk. Ray, relying once again on his fortitude, heads right into the foray, and he and the white become tangled in a violent bear hug, while Fuego is too stunned to speak. Isaac changes tactics immediately and activates feral weapons, extending razor-sharp claws designed for tearing and slashing. Seraph decides to jump onto its back in an attempt to get it off of Ray, while Fuego, shaking off the fear, relies on Old Faithful, Dominate, and tries to catch the White's eye. Unfortunately, Fuego's will is not strong enough to overcome the beast behind the White's eyes, and it subsequently throws Seraph off, leaving her with some superficial damage. Isaac fares a bit better and manages to stick it with his claws, but this victory is short-lived, as from out of no nowhere, a car slams into both the White and Ray, also giving him some superficial damage. But the White is not out. Instead, it leaps above the bridge, causing some commotion from the traffic up there. The Coterie take note that this mysterious car is odd, a vintage hearse, and it's being driven by none other than Cat Costello, the Hikata they met their first night at Richter's, played by the amazing Shane Easton, who LA by Night fans remember as Eva's sire Katya the Tremere. Cat also has a skull named Frankie with her, a skull we've seen before in LA by night, and if it's indeed the same one, I believe it belongs to Alex Ward IRL, but don't quote me on that because I'm not totally sure if that's <laughs> true or a rumor. If Fran Drescher was a mortician instead of a nanny, you have Cat Costello. I love everything about the character, the hair, the outfit, the skull, the accent. It's exactly how I picture New York City Hikata in my head, and Shane ticked every box. Cat tells them to get in the car, and Michael and Angela follow in the minivan. Cat chastises them for attempting to go after something like a white, 
and claims that they were lucky she was already in the neighborhood looking for them. Kat tells him that she's taking them to the Costello residence, ignoring Ray's outburst, who is justifiably angry after she hit him with her car. As they drive, Kat randomly chit-chats with Frankie the Skull, disturbing Ray the most, it seems. So Frankie decides to draw on the window closest to Ray, the onomatopoeia, shh, which Ray obeys. For those of you who don't know, Hikata specialize in necromancy, and as such, they can have ghost retainers, better known as wraiths. If you want an in-depth video about the Giovanni and the forming of Clan Hikata, you can watch that here. If you want to know more about wraiths and how life can get worse after it ends, I'll leave my Wraithy Oblivion lore playlist in the description. The Coterie notice Woodlawn Cemetery coming up as they drive, and they learn that the Costello residency is in fact a mortuary. Fuego seems reticent to go in, whispering, I think she works with Freddy Spaghetti. Great callback. Once inside, Kat gets right down to business, asking the Coterie if they know of Marco Putanesca. The Coterie claim to know the Putanescas and admit to kicking the asses of Marco and his goodfellas at Drexler's place. Kat also brings up the old tech for Shreknet, rehashing what we already know from the last three episodes. The Coterie are totally honest with their involvement, and Kat respects that, saying that both sides had their reasons for the hostilities. Ray texts Drexler and asks what he owes Marco, and Drexler responds with a quarter of a million dollars. But Kat tells them that the Putanescas are trouble, a pain in the ass. Kat offers to keep them off the Coterie's back in exchange for a favor. She tells them about the HMS Hussar, a ship that ran aground and sank off the coast of New York in 1780, and about its captain, a man that both she and Frankie call Charlie, but is likely referring to the real-life captain, a man named Charles Pohl. She claims to want to speak to his ghost, but his remains are underneath the developing crescent, and asks the Coterie to bring back his skull. Fuego suddenly very interested in helping, anything to sabotage the Crescent, and the rest of the Coterie eventually agree. Before they go, Fuego asks if she can hold the skull, and whispers to Frankie, asking if he can hear her, and the skull vibrates in response. Fuego then attempts to dominate Frankie to get him to work for her, in a twist I did not see coming, and I was screaming. Move over, Panhard, there's new royalty on the block. In response, a bunch of books barrage Fuego from the nearby bookcase. Frankie clearly displeased with this attempt. Don't worry, Fuego, he doesn't know what he's missing. Kat asks if one of them could tell her about their last breath as a human, a very Hikata question, and Sarah volunteers. She says it was Valentine's Day, and her sire wanted to talk to her about an opportunity to expand her study under his tutelage. There was champagne, and when Seraph woke up, she was no longer mortal. Does this mean she was in some sort of romantic relationship with her sire, the man who holds her mother under a blood bond? Please, Seraph, please. I have so many questions. Before the Coterie make their egress, another wraith, Franklin, whispers in Kat's ear and tells her, we feel things that belong to them on Big Island. Based on Kat's reaction and the subsequent uh, talking about the Sabbat after this, uh, the them in this case is the Sabbat, which Kat, of course, goes on to explain the Coterie, who have heard about them many times at this point. Um, and by Big Island, well, that can only mean Manhattan? where the ivory tower sits pretty and sparkling over the city. As the Coterie get back into the minivan, Isaac suggests that eventually they should speak with his sire, that they would know more about the Sabbat and whether or not they are active again in the city. Ray also informs the Coterie of Drexler's large debt and casts doubt on whether or not Cat Costello can help them deter an enemy who's after a quarter of a million, and suggests they try and come up with some contingency plans in case the Putanesca come knocking anyway. If you haven't already, please go follow the World of Darkness on Twitch and YouTube, and if you can, sub to those channels as well. If you enjoyed this video, consider subscribing to me and let me know your thoughts on episode four, Like a Graveyard, in the comments. As always, I'll see you in the next one.